Well, welcome to Stanford, everybody. I'm Dave, and uh, I'm going to give a little bit different perspective on things. Uh, from I'm an engineer, so that's the kind of perspective I'm, I'm going to be uh, providing. So a little bit about me. Um, who, who knows Watch Mr. Wizard? Who's, who will admit to being that old? So in Chicago, the premise of the program was that these kids would drop into Mr. Wizard's kitchen, and he'd go through. He didn't have a kitchen. He had this lab. So. It was really neat, so that's what got me into wanting to be a scientist. Um, I went to University of Michigan, got an uh, electrical engineering degree, uh, got a degree in biomedical engineering from uh, Northwestern, and um, then I found myself uh, out here working at the VA Medical Center in um, a facility called the Rehabilitation Research and Development Center, where uh, we uh, address the um, needs of uh, veterans with disabilities. And I did that for a long time before I graduated. And now I find myself at Stanford. And I, it's about a seven minute walk from my office to here. So it's good to be on campus here. So um, my claim to fame is being an early home computer adopter. Uh, this is my setup back in 78, 79. A couple eight inch disk drives, an Altair computer, uh, a home built acoustic modem. Um, a transistor radio, a TV converted to be a monitor. And uh, this is the innards of an eight inch floppy disk. So that's where I got my start. Um, and, um, but now I'm, I'm teaching um, this course, which um, pretty much focuses on teaching uh, human aspects of technology um, to uh, students here at Stanford. Um, a little bit about the course, it's called Perspectives in Assistive Technology. It starts in January. It, um, the enrollment is open to uh, all students, from freshmen to grad students, from any, any discipline. Um, and um, the lectures are open to the community. So if you send me, send me your email address, I'll put you on the list so you can get announcements for that. So it'll be on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons, um, starting in January. In the class, what? What's your email address? It's at the end. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So in the class, we have discussions where we talk about you know, certain things, uh, interesting things to uh, promote critical thinking. Um, also bring in lots of guest lecturers to talk about various aspects of, of assistive technology. And, um, it, um, and these are, are, are people who are engineers, researchers, uh, clinical people, therapists. Um, one of my best classes is one where I have s uh, students with a disability get up in front and talk about themselves and how they're successful and what technology they use to make them su successful. Um, one of the things I'm going to try this year is having a, an assistive technology fair where people just bring stuff so the students can get some hands-on on things. We also have some tours of facilities. We go to the VA. We go to a robotics company. And students can work on team or individual projects. The projects come from, a lot of them come from the VA. Uh, a lot of connections there. Uh, also get uh, all sorts of projects from assistive living centers, from people in the community, from, from companies. Sometimes students bring their own projects. And they say, I have this idea for a project. Can I work on it? And, and if they convince me, I have them work on it. And individuals. Um, with disabilities sometimes uh, propose projects. So what I'm going to do is just talk about some of the um, observations that I've had about uh, designing uh, for people who are older adults and for people with disabilities just from my time at the VA and uh, at Stanford <coughs> teaching. So even though it's, it's sort of focused on those specific things, I think you can generalize these concepts to whatever you're working on. So think, expand your brain with that. So in, in working through the, the issues here, it seemed to um, form uh, four different categories. And so I'm going to go through them one at a time. And for each one, I want to get some participation from the audience. So if you agree with it, I want to see you know, heads nodding. And if you're really into it, you, know, you can say right on or amen or whatever. So, <laughs> so can so let's, uh, let's, this is one of my students from about three years ago. 
So in the general category, uh, assistive technology is not just about devices, but it's also all the things that go around providing those devices. You know, where do people uh, get, grant, get grant money to do research and development? Uh, how, are the, how, is things, how are things reimbursed? Who writes the laws? How do you assess um, how good the products are? So these are all things that are a part of assistive technology from my point of view. And assistive technology, um, not only benefits you know, older folks and people with disabilities, but I include uh, family members, caregivers, and healthcare professionals who care for these people. So I try to make a broad a definition as possible for assistive technology. And the activities that are involved in with assistive technology are everything that we do every day, you know, education, vocation, activities of daily living, you know, being mobile, getting around, doing things on your own, being independent, um, having a better quality of life. So there's a lot of people working in the field in, in ac academia and as, pr as professionals, um, you know, students, researchers, you know, healthcare professionals, designers, everybody. Um, okay, who can identify this person here? Let me hear, let me hear it. Sherman. Yes. <laughs> and who was his Where cohort? Mr. Peabody. Mr. Peabody, great, excellent. So, um, from the people point of view, um, everybody encounters disabilities or aging, you know, um, either it's us or, or people in our family or friends or colleagues, whatever. So sometimes these disabilities are temporary and other times they're permanent. Sometimes they're two-dimensional. Sometimes they look three-dimensional. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so a person's disability depends on their circumstances. Um, you know, what they want to do and what kind of solutions there are out there. I mean, you can have a, a large disability, a big disability, but if there's a solution that will help you do what you want to do, then, then you feel independent. And to a squirrel, a straw is, is high tech, okay? <laughs> and so it's another example of an animal using a tool, so. Um, everybody is self-conscious on, on, of how they appear and has to present themselves, wants to present themselves in a positive manner. Now, no matter how old you are and no matter what your disability is, you want to have choices on what you wear and what, how you appear. There, there has to be a variety of things on the market. Um, and the things that, you know, have to have a, a certain sense of aesthetic. A person who uses a wheelchair all day, that's, it's their clothing, you know, so you want to have choices in that as well. Uh, labels and perceptions can influence how we think and treat others. I'm reminded of this uh, Time Magazine cover where they deliberately made O.J. Simpson look really dark and sinister, but you know that he didn't look that way at all. And so it brings up a, a, a point of you know so we have to make a judgment sometime. You know whether whether a person or an individual is is deserving of the care we give them. Are they? Is that person one of us or one of them? Can we identify with them as, as in our group or not? Um, and, um, and how you label people is important too. So, you know, we do a lot of things with people first terminology. So you mentioned that they're, they're people with a disability rather than the blind or the disabled and stuff, which sort of separates them from the people in general. So that's very important, how we talk about people. Many people could benefit from assistive technology devices and services. You know, you have old people, you have people who use computers. You know, the solution has to be appropriate for the situation and that can take a lot of doing. Um, so on, on one hand, you have many people, but on the other hand, each person is an individual with their own desires, needs, and, and goals. And you can have two people that are blind who might have totally different needs. So it's important to recognize that. Um, so I, I really feel strongly about that. You know, it's in our constitution that, that all people are created equal and everybody has a potential and deserves opportunities to succeed in life. And among that is to express who they are and to, to engage in chosen activities. And Neil Young said, a chance to be cool. We all have to have a chance to be cool. And who is cooler than Bugs Bunny? I mean, I'm telling you. Um, this is the most important slide here. Despite the large number of people who are older adults or experience disabilities, 
Assistive technology devices tend to be expensive because the market for a specific device is small. This slide shows that there's one billion people with disabilities, but the companies, again, are small because of the specific needs of everybody. It's almost like each person has to be custom, you have to have a custom solution. And when you have that, you don't get economies of scale, so the price never comes down um, on stuff, and that's, that's just the way it's, it is. Um, but you can have a, a, a successful assistive technology device if it's adjustable so you can, it can meet a wider, uh, the needs of a wider range of people. And computers do that really nicely because you know, the software can be changed. And you can also think of an iPad or something as a platform for, for uh, software that provides a, a communication device or uh, reads um, your glucose readings on a continuous basis. So the fact that this device is, is a mass market device and its prices come down, people can use that as, uh, to their advantage in, in developing an, an assistive technology uh, product. And as others have said, users are key uh, members of the design development process. And we're talking, again, not, not just about people with disabilities or older adults, but family members, caregivers, and all the other people that come in contact with them. So it's important to think about, about all these people when, when, you're, when you're working on a product. And there's a concept called universal designs where uh, good design should be accessible to all. So that's an, ex uh, an attempt to expand the usability of a particular device to encompass um, ex extreme users. Um, the first thing in part of the process is to understand the problem. This is really critical and this is where the empathy part comes in. Sometimes it's not obvious where the problem is, and sometimes you need x-rays to, to figure that out. But to find out the, uh, you know, what the problem is, you just can't ask the person, you know, what is, what is your problem? They won't tell you. You really have to sit down with them and spend a day with them, whatever. So you really have to observe and question them you know, over a long period of time. And you've got to ask lots of, lots of questions. You've got to think about the problem. Why, why does this problem exist? You know, what, are people doing now? What are the standard solutions? Why are they not working? Why are they not available? Sometimes, you know, you ask a question and you may not get the answer you expect, so you have to deal with that. Um, the design, <laughs> the design development process. Uh, a lot of people have um, have uh, you know have these nice um, graphs and stuff uh, about how it should be done, um, but. You know, I think the problem comes first, and the need is a judgment based upon analysis of the problem. So um, the need doesn't come first, the problem comes first, and then you figure out, you know, based on your analysis, what, the, what, the, what is really needed. Do you teach this in Stanford? <laughs> it's amazing that you still let me, you know, teach this. <laughs> no, this is all true. <laughs> and educational. So... Um, when you talk to one person, you get just their problem statement, which may not you know, be applicable to the next person. So if you're coming up with a, a product that you want to sell to a lot of people, you need to get a lot of, a lot of input. So you need to talk to a lot of people. Um, and I, my quote is, one person's point of view is not a consensus. So you need to talk to a lot of people and get, uh, get a, a feel for the entire range of, of, of needs. And, and then you have to um, figure out what else is out there. So you need to maybe, uh, you know, there's books on this. You can go to the library. You can go on the Internet. You can um, um, look at professional societies who look at this. There's listservs that, that uh, talk about this. You can certainly look into catalogs and find what other products are there. I've seen too many times um, people working on a brand-new product and, but you know the solution. There is a solution out there already, so you do want to avoid any duplication of effort. <clears throat> and you know, when you talk to a doctor or something, you know he knows about medical stuff, but an engineer knows about engineering stuff. So a doctor might, you know, doesn't have the information an engineer or designer have. So what that, does that mean? You have to have a team of lots of people who have lots of um, information that they can bring to bear on a problem. And again, there, there's books and stuff that you can, you can, you can refer to. The design development process, uh, here's, your, here's your starting point and here's your ending point. 
And like I said, it's not a linear thing. You cannot go from here to here. Uh, it's required that you take this, this course. And this course means that you're going to look, you may be off track for a while. You may be making a lot of mistakes, but this is necessary to go through this. And so what that means is that you have to do a lot of prototyping and testing and feedback, analyzing, uh, redesigning, and iterating. If you talk to um, somebody that has actually have a product on the market, ask them, well, you know, this product here, how many, how many prototypes did, did it take to get there? And they'll say 10 or 12. And how long did it take? Oh, it took three years. You know, how much money did it take? And it took a lot more money than you might think. So it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, we had a staff meeting and we came up with the, some of these concepts. Prototyping is an extension of thinking. You can only think about a solution so much in your head, and then you have to talk about it, draw it, you know, build it, turn it over in your hand, you know, break it. And uh, so you ask questions, you know, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? Um, and, and critically, you have to learn from your mistakes and then you know, go through the process again. And indeed, failure is the highway to success. I mean, there's, here's, here's the clip art. You know, I mean, what more proof do you need? <laughs> so, it, so failure is not the opposite of success. It's just a stepping stone. It's a pathway. And so in order to get to your, your goal quickly, you have to fail fast and often. <clears throat> But maybe in extreme cases, Edison, when, it, when he's looking for a, the filament and went through 10,000 different things that didn't work, well, he didn't analyze, yeah, I'm, I'm almost there. He didn't analyze what he was doing and what wasn't working. So if you have a product that is a result of one person's uh, needs, it might not, might, may not serve the purpose of anybody else. So even though this may be a good idea for somebody, I don't think anybody has a, a dream grill that makes pancakes and eggs, you know, when you wake up in the morning. So, and then you have to, you have to consider all users, not just peop, men who have cold faces. This is a very crucial point here. Product aesthetics have a, have a profound effect on purchase decisions, acceptance, and compliance. Here's a, a emergency call device that's on the market for forty-five dollars. You can buy it at, at Walmart and uh, and uh, Fry's. And it has a, has a clip, and you can wear it around your neck. But people tend not to want to buy it because it makes them look old and, and feel disabled. So uh, Jules, over there, there she is, she did this. She took this device and, and added a little bit of um, uh, at, uh, static, uh, at, uh, aesthetic to it and made it into a belt, belt buckle. So now it can work for, for kids who have lost their their parents. So here's another quote. Mere functionality is insufficient. You have to have something that looks good as well. So in summary, the, the process takes a lot longer than you might expect. And you need to work in teams and collaborate. And maybe you want to collaborate and have some students work on an idea uh, with you. And so I want you to think about doing that. And here's Endeavor flying over Golden Gate Bridge. So that's it for me. Here's my email address and uh, my course website. Anybody have any questions for Dave? Yes. What kind of projects have students um, Students have worked on a whole range of things. Um, you know, uh, worked on, on canes, on wheelchairs, on um, products for kids with autism, uh, products for kids in, in school who have disabilities. Um, um, uh, we created a, uh, a hybrid lever drive wheelchair that's on the market um, with a company in Los Gatos. And um, um, things for, um, for people who are in wheelchairs to operate piano pedals and stuff, this is actually a pretty common problem, as I understand it, and because I've come across it like four times now. Um, so those are the kinds of things. I mean, there's more on the website. Rota Mobility is a company that right. they worked with, and, um, and it's a really neat, and I think to leverage this great resource of design students at Stanford who want to think about these populations, I think is something we definitely encourage you to get in touch with David and get your projects really getting iterated on by students using a lot of these methods. Ken? Ken? So you incorporate the idea of kind of environmental press your design, the idea that you want to do the minimal amount for somebody so that they are also forced to do 
um, you know, all, all that stuff is, is good to think about, but the priority in my class is giving the students a good academic experience. So that, that comes first. And actually, it, students can work on their project beyond the one quarter and take it into uh, commercialization if they want, but when you're doing the initial one or two or three prototypes, you know, that isn't a priority. 